Let's begin from digestion. In small intestine, dietary triacylglycerols undergo emulsification by bowel acids with further hydrolysis by pancreatic lipase to monoacylglycerols and free fatty acids. To illustrate hydrolysis, its triacylglycerol molecule, basically its glycerol and three fatty acids, and this hydrolysis pancreatic lipase at first cleave one fatty acid, now it's diacylglycerol, and then it cleave another fatty acid, so the final products of hydrolysis of one triacylglycerol molecule, it's monoacylglycerol and two free fatty acids. Then monoacylglycerol and free fatty acids are taken up by intestinal epithelial cells, and immediately they are converted back to triacylglycerols. Also, intestinal epithelial cells absorb dietary cholesterol molecules. Very important that uptake of cholesterol molecules into enterocytes is mediated by a sterol transporter called Neiman Peak C1 like 1 protein in PC1 L1. It's high yield to know because we have drug called azetamib that blocks this transporter and thereby it decreases cholesterol absorption. So, because of that, azetamib is used as lipid lowering drug, usually in combination with statins, for example, azetamib simvastatin or azetamib asorvastatin. Once an enterocyte, cholesterol can be transported back into intestinal lumen. This process is mediated by transporters called sterolin 1 and sterolin 2. And high yield to know that these transporters are encoded by genes called ABCG5 and ABCG8. Because mutation in these genes will cause defects in cholesterol transportation back into intestinal lumen, and this will cause progressive accumulation of cholesterol with hypercholesterolemia and this disorder called cytosterolemia. So once dietary lipids are absorbed into enterocytes, a problem appears. How to transport them? Because the major principle is that only water-soluble molecules, so-called hydrophilic molecules, can be safely transported through bloodstream because only water-soluble molecules are stable in this environment. In contrast to this, hydrophobic molecules as triacylglycerol and cholesterol are uncontrollable in water environment. They can easily uncontrollably penetrate through any cell membrane. And the feature that makes molecule hydrophilic is polar groups of the molecule. High yield example is the difference between conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Recall that unconjugated bilirubin is hydrophobic molecule, and because of that, it can easily penetrate through any cell membranes into different tissues. For example, it can cross blood-brain barrier and diffuse into gray matter in central nervous system with development of crinicterus. In contrast to this, conjugated bilirubin have polar region that gives this molecule hydrophilic properties that makes this molecule more safe, because now this molecule cannot freely diffuse into tissues. And also to prevent carnicterus in case of neonatal jaundice in newborns we use phototherapy. The logic is that light causes photooxidation of bilirubin molecule and converts it to a water-soluble isomer called lumirubin that cannot penetrate through membranes. And also because now it's hydrophilic molecule, it can be excreted into urine and bile. The same principle is used in lipid transportation. The outer surface of the molecule must be strictly hydrophilic. Organisms solve this problem and to transport triacylglycerols and cholesterol molecules, intestinal and liver cells compact lipids and particles, add to them protein molecules called upper lipoproteins, and the final result is particles that have hydrophilic outer surface and hydrophobic core, and these particles called lipoproteins. And for now, important to understand that the role that all lipoproteins share they transport lipids from tissue to tissue to supply lipids needs of different cells, and they transport them in very controllable fashion through receptor ligand interaction that makes this transportation totally safe. Even from the term itself, we can say that lipoproteins consist of lipids and proteins. And there are four major types of lipids. It's triacylglycerols, cholesterol esters, phospholipids, and free cholesterol molecules. And by protein part, we understand different types of upper lipoproteins. So, again, the major principle how all these molecules are organized in one particle is that to be transported through plasma, the outer surface of the molecule must be polar, because polarity gives molecule hydrophilic properties that make molecule water soluble and thereby stable in water environment. And in these circumstances, the particle can be safely transported through bloodstream. 
Also very important that to store nonpolar lipids as triacylglycerols and cholesterol esters inside the particle, the inner surface of the particle must be hydrophobic, because hydrophobic substances are stable only in hydrophobic environment. So that's why lipoproteins must have hydrophobic core and hydrophilic coat. To explain how all these substances form lipoprotein structure, let's briefly discuss some properties of lipids and proteins. First of all, phospholipids, let's take phosphatidylcholine and free cholesterol. It's amphiphilic molecules. By this term we mean that they have both polar and non-polar regions in their structure. Polar region gives them hydrophilic properties and non-polar region gives them hydrophobic properties. And this feature makes them perfect structural components for lipoproteins membrane. So the polar region is orientated to the surface of the particle that will be in contact with plasma and the hydrophobic region is orientated inside, creating hydrophobic environment for lipid storage, so-called hydrophobic core. Now about strictly hydrophobic molecules. Triacylglycerols, as we know it's molecules that consist of glycerol and three fatty acids that together form triacylglycerol molecule, cholesterol ester it's a molecule that consists of cholesterol and another molecule, typically its fatty acid. This molecule is formed by a reaction called esterification. To explain esterification of cholesterol, there is cholesterol molecule, and cholesterol esterification can occur by two ways. The first pathway is a reaction of free cholesterol molecule with fatty acyl CoA that is catalyzed by a specific enzyme acyl coa cholesterol acyl transferase. This enzyme transfers fatty acid from a fatty acyl coa to hydroxyl group of cholesterol, and this reaction occurs primarily in liver tissue in order to store cholesterol molecules in lipid droplets. The another pathway is reaction of cholesterol with lecithin, also called phosphatidylcholine. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase (LCAT) and results in production of cholesterol ester and lysolestin. This reaction is very important in reverse cholesterol transport, but for now it's important to understand why esterification occurs. The logic is that to store cholesterol in lipid droplets in tissues, or to transport cholesterol in hydrophobic core of lipoprotein, the molecule must be strictly hydrophobic, and free cholesterol have amphiphilic properties due to its hydroxyl groups that gives polarity. So by esterification, instead of polar hydroxyl group, cholesterol binds non-polar fatty acid that makes this molecule hydrophobic and thereby fat soluble. And in this form it can be stored in lipid droplets or it can be transported in hydrophobic core of lipoprotein. So because triacylglycerols and cholesterol esters are lipophilic molecules, they are insoluble in plasma and because of that, they must be transported only in hydrophobic core of lipoprotein. The another structural component of lipoproteins are proteins, that are called apolipoproteins. Apolipoproteins can be integral or peripheral. Integral apolipoproteins are ApoB48 and ApoB100. They are embedded deep in the surface of lipid membrane of lipoprotein particle, and because they are located in the membrane, basically they are structural components of the membrane, and due to this reason they cannot be transferred from one lipoprotein particle to another. In contrast to this, peripheral apolipoproteins are located on the membrane, so they are peripherally applied to the membrane, and due to this reason they can be easily transferred from one lipoprotein to another. In terms of polarity, in proteins the logic is the same as with lipids. Peripheral apolipoproteins have more polar amino acids, and integral apolipoproteins have more non-polar amino acids. And their polar amino acids are located to the outer surface of the membrane, and non-polar regions are located within the membrane and on the inner surface of the membrane. Now about the function of apolipoproteins. So, as we already said, integral apolipoproteins as ApoB48 and ApoB100 are a part of lipoproteins membrane, so the first function is structural function. Also probably as a more specific function, this serves its ligands for interaction with lipoprotein receptor in tissues. For example, liver and many extrahepatic tissues express low-density lipoprotein receptor. 
and this receptor can uptake lipoprotein particles that have only upper B100 or upper E upper lipoproteins. So because, for example, low density lipoproteins have upper B100, hepatocytes can easily uptake them. But for example, kilomicrons have only upper B48, and hepatocytes cannot uptake them by this receptor. So in order to be uptaken by hepatocytes, kilomicrons acquire upper E from high density lipid particles, and now with upper E, hepatocytes can uptake them. So basically they serve for a typical receptor ligand interaction. Also, they serve as cofactors for enzymes. For example, presence of upper C2 is necessary for activation of lipoprotein lipase to provide adequate rate of hydrolysis of triacylglycerols, or presence of upper A1 is necessary for activation of lecithin cholesterol acyltransferase, that is, provide esterification of cholesterol. But also, some upper lipoproteins sources enzymes inhibitors. For example, upper A2 and upper C3 are inhibitors of lipoprotein lipase. Now, very important concept. Lipoproteins can be separated into classes by ultracentrifugation of plasma or by electrophoresis. The major concept of ultracentrifugation of plasma is that particles that have lowest density have the highest flotation rate. So, after centrifugation, they will be located on top. And if we depict this, on top will be the particles with lowest density, and these particles called kilomicrons, then everything very logically. Very low density lipoproteins, intermediate density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, and high density lipoproteins. And as we see, kilomicrons have unique name, because they have unique feature. It's the only type of lipoproteins that is secreted into the lymphatic system and lymphatic fluid, as we know, called chyle. Also, intermediate density lipoproteins are called this way because they are intermediate form between very low density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. So, what are the major factors that determine the density of these particles? First of all, triacylglycerol molecule is lighter than water molecule, but cholesterol is heavier than water. So, the particles with highest triacylglycerols content have lowest density and thereby they have the highest flotation rate. So even now we can say that the main transporters of triacylglycerols in the bloodstream are kilomicrons and very low density lipoproteins. And obviously particles with highest density have highest cholesterol concentration. The typical example of how logically this works there is very low density lipoprotein particle that have very high triacylglycerol to cholesterol ratio. Because the amount of triacylglycerols in this particle is very high, it makes concentration of cholesterol very low. But when lipoprotein lipase hydrolyze some portion of triacylglycerols, with decrease in triacylglycerols, the ratio decreases, and now concentration of cholesterol in the particle increases. And because of that, the density of this particle increase. Now this particle called intermediate density lipoprotein particle. And with further hydrolysis of triacylglycerols, the ratio decreases further, and the concentration of cholesterol increase, so the density of the particle increase, and now this particle called low density lipoprotein particle. Also the second factor, proteins have higher density than lipids of water. The highest lipid content in the particle, the larger is the size of the particle, and the lower is proteins to lipid ratio. And because proteins are denser than lipids, with decrease in size, the density of the particle increases. The typical example how lipid content affects size of the particle, high fat meal leads to formation of a larger kilomicrons particle, because with high fat meal the amount of triacylglycerols inside them increase. In contrast to this, in fasting state, kilomicrons particles are small, because they carry only a small amount of triacylglycerols. And one of the reasons why kilomicrons are less dense than very low density lipoprotein particles, because as we know they are both the major transporters of triacylglycerols in the bloodstream, is the larger triacylglycerols content in kilomicrons, that creates lower proteins to lipid ratio. Also, with electrophoresis, lipoproteins are separated into alpha lipoproteins, its high density lipoproteins, beta lipoproteins, its low density lipoproteins, and pre beta lipoproteins, its very low density lipoproteins.